plan on preaching a, a Christmas sermon on Sunday. Uh, it's an old Ed Taylor classic, The Child Grew Up. Hallelujah. And uh, numerous people haven't heard that sermon before, so we're going to preach her. Hallelujah. It's a good one. Amen. It's a, it's a cla- pastor. That's right. Classic sermons by Pastor Ed. Hallelujah. We're, we're talking about, we moved through the, the different various Old Testament covenants, um, and we kind of brushed over those lightly other than the, uh, the Abrahamic covenant. We did spend more time with that because that is more relative to, our, to the covenant of the new covenant than any other. Others are just ideas. If you weren't here Sunday, I encourage you to go back and listen to the, as I listed, the different covenants uh, in the Old Testament. And I probably didn't cover every last single one that's possible out there, but the major ones. And um, where you can get, go and study them. And, and the reason we gave those is you, so you can find the strength of covenant, the purpose of covenant in the Old Testament. And uh, how important it is and how, what, what bearing it carried with people. Okay? Uh, just so you'll know, understand the mindset when they were, when they were ma- making a covenant, it wasn't a flippant thing. Now, see, uh, how many know uh, the, our handshake, the, the, the handshake we have today was really came out of cutting covenants. Because people would cut, you know, cut the palms of the wrist and put their hands together. And then bring the blood together, and that that was that was a cup that was that was mixing the blood, and they entered in the covenant. That's why a handshake for so long had such strength to it. We shook on it. See, that came out of a covenant mindset. You know that once, once they shook on it, it yeah, that was it. You know, I you know my, my oath, my word. I've given my oath. I've given my word. You know, um, they, they they shook on it, and so forth. So, uh, and of course, as, as we go through time and people become more and more uh, secularized and less and, and more demonized, I don't know how else to say it, you know, and, and more ungodly in their thinking, they just think, I'm, I'll shake hands on it, cross my fingers, and it don't mean anything. Well, if you did that in the day of a covenant, they'd go out and kill you. If you cut a covenant, if they broke that covenant, they'd kill you. As a matter of fact, your own family would kill you. So, covenant carried a very strong, strong meaning and, and, and strong sense of obligation. And not just, uh, not, it's more than, I only think the word strong is a good word. But it, it carried a, uh, a, 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 level, a level of commitment that you can't get around and you can't just circumvent. And like I said, it was so strong that if I were to cut the covenant with someone and then I broke it, my family would kill me. They, would hunt my own, they wouldn't have to wait for the elders to come to it. Your own family would kill you. Because it was, it was a violation of something that was so, so sacred and so powerful and uh, so forth. So, so when we understand that Jesus entered into a covenant with, with the Father in, in uh, fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and that we are now part of that covenant through uh, entering in through the new birth, there is a strength to that covenant. Talked about Sunday how that Abraham proved his faith by offering Isaac. Uh, obedience made the covenant good. Remember, God said, because you obeyed my voice, I'm going to do this. Um, <clears throat> when Israel later broke the covenant, they went into captivity. And, and we kind of got off of some of that Sunday morning, how that there's such a, a resistance to doing, obeying, commitment. We got into talking about Sunday morning, how that God said that in those days he's going to write the laws in our hearts and our minds. And, and we asked the question, if he wrote them in our hearts and our minds, what does he want us to do? He wants us to do them. All right, and you've got a lot of people teaching or saying that, you know, we, anything that, that we have to do is law or whatever. Well, God didn't write his laws in our minds and in our hearts so we could just have them there for, for a uh, window dressing. He wrote them there so we would do them. All right. Um, we talk about that Jesus was obedient to God. He lived a sinless walk. He was a perfect sacrifice. Sealed the covenant. Uh, eternal and cannot be broken. Now, it cannot be broken between God the Father and God the Son. See, people take eternal security and take stuff and go, they don't understand. The covenant between the Father and the man, the man Christ Jesus. People who get into the kingdom of God through the new birth partake of it because they're part of the body of Christ. If you relinquish the, your relationship in the body of Christ, you're not in the covenant anymore. And, you know, the covenant's not broken, you're just not partaking of it. Okay? Um, God cut the covenant to bring forth a new nation. I mean, I mean the uh, nation of Israel. Uh, with Abraham, I'm sorry, God cut the covenant to Abraham to bring forth the nation of Israel. He cut it with Jesus to bring forth the holy nation. And uh, that's where we kind of left off. Now, we enter into the covenant. This is where we're going to. David entered the covenant by circumcision of his flesh. Amen? 
uh, I say David, it started with Moses, but it went on through. I um, mean, Abraham started with Abraham. And all the way through, they always had to enter the covenants through the, through the circumcision of the flesh. Um, we enter in, look over in Romans chapter 2. Not with the circumcision of the flesh, but the circumcision of the heart. Okay, so it's a spiritual covenant. Hallelujah, as it were. He, he, uh, let's back up here to verse um, 28. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so, you know, and of course, you, just, you can't take that and run off too, too far because Paul turns right around chapter 3, verse 1, says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is, is there of circumcision, and much every way. So you, you can't take verse 28 and 29 and go build some weird thing out of it, all right? But he's saying here the Jew, the Jew inwardly is the one that, that uh, is the spiritual nation of Israel. Now, let me say this. Natural Israel will have to become a spiritual Jew. Natural Israel will have to become a spiritual Jew. In other words, they, they may have a natural uh, 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 lineage of Ju Judaism. They will have to become a natural Jew. Now, I, quite frankly, uh, I know a lot of people use the term, I don't like the term Messianic Jew because that's not what the Bible calls people. Right. We, we get cute sometimes. People come up with stuff and, you know, and they're talking about our relationship with Israel and that kind of stuff. But the Bible doesn't call them Messianic Jews. Right. The Bible calls them Christians. The people who were called Christians at Antioch were Jews. They weren't called Messianic Jews. They were called Christians. But we try to get cute. See, the people come up with ideas that sound cool and sound spiritual and sound like we really got a hold on stuff. But why don't we just stay with the Bible? It's a whole lot better just to stay with the Bible. The Jew has to be born again. Well, they just received Jesus as Messiah. Well, Jesus told Jews you had to be born again. He didn't say you just had to, you know, become a messianic Jew. He said you had to be born again. That's Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Hello? Amen. So we don't need to be cute. Well, you know, just stick with the word. Somebody came up with that, and everybody kind of embellishes that, and they all get all, you know, weird about it. Some people can get, can get weird about Israel. Now, let me say something. I, sub I believe that we're supposed to support Israel, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We are to, we got, the, God's going to graft the Jews back in. We, we should not hate the Jews. We shouldn't be working against the Jews. We should be working in, you know, in, in harmony with the Jews because they are the root of Christianity. But let me say this. We don't need to get cute or, or un unbiblical in our relationship. They must be born again. Amen. <clears throat> Peter, Peter preached to him and said, repent and be baptized everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. He didn't say anything cute. It was a matter of fact, repent and get saved. All right? So, I'm sorry. We, we, people, I just, those, those things are the things that, that kind of, that, I don't know how to say it. People do that kind of stuff and it sounds something, but it's not biblical. I like staying with the Bible. If a Jew is born again, guess what? He's a Christian. Bottom line. That went over real big. It's the truth. All right. Um, so it's, it's, it is the circumcision of the heart that God is after. After the, after the circumcision, and, and remember in the Old Covenant, after the circumcision, there was exchange. Um, there's different exchanges that went on during, throughout the different covenants. Um, Jesus' covenant with the Father is found in John, you know, look at John 16, 14. This is, remember, uh, Jesus says in John 16, um, 14, he says, He that glorifies me, for he, he shall glorify me, talking to the Father. Better back up to verse 13. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, 
That's Jesus. For he shall receive a vine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take a vine and shall show it unto you. So, you know, Jesus is in covenant with the Father. All things that the Father hath are the Son's. Amen. And all things are ours, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ, possessive, and Christ is God's. When you come into the kingdom of God, let me, let me say something here. I think we need to go back to a little bit, <laughs> not, not a little bit, a whole lot more emphasis on the fact that when you come into the kingdom of God, you're selling out to God. Amen. We are not coming in to the sugar daddy uh, bowl. We're not coming in looking for our, our ship coming in. You know, the, our lottery ticket just got punched. We are selling out 100% to God. Jesus said that he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of him. See, we do, we do too much to try to get people to want to be saved because there's so many benefits. That went over big. Man, if you get saved, you're going to get rich. You're going to have all your needs met. You're going to have houses. You're going to have lands. Man, this is, just, this is good news. You know what the good news to the unbeliever is? You don't have to go to hell. As a matter of fact, if you come into the kingdom of God and accept Jesus as Christ as Lord, he redeems you out of destruction and misery and brings you into his family. Instead of, you're going to get zoos and wham-whams. You've got to sell out to Jesus Christ. When the rich man came to Jesus and, and, and asked him what he must do, he said, go sell all you have, give, to the, give it to the poor, and take up your cross and follow me. Abandon everything in a complete sellout in service to the Most High God. That's, you don't get that preached anymore. Not much. We get a lot of, you know, uh, you can do anything you want to. God, God don't care. You can, you can just join our, this group and that group and, and, you know, and come in and get your name on the book. And God don't care. You know, we're going to get you in somehow. We're going to make it real comfortable for you to get saved. No, he said to, he, his, his command to the church was go preach the gospel to every creature. And, 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 and one of the things that Peter stood up on the day. Now, I've got to think when Jesus said go preach the gospel to every creature. And then Peter got up and, and preached and said repent. Amen that Jesus knew a little bit about what he was talking about at the time. I mean, as Peter knew a little bit about what he was talking about at the time. He equated the message of repentance and selling out to the lordship of Jesus with the gospel. See, we've equated it to houses and cars. Because we've overemphasized, over, overemphasized, not, you don't need to underemphasize, but you don't need to overemphasize either the prosperity side of the, uh, of, of the New Testament, of the Bible. To the point that it's more important than committing to the lordship of Jesus Christ. This is a heavy revy. A slap upside the head. I know people don't like to hear this. They don't want to, they don't want to preach it anymore. We're called, we're called, I mean, I mean we're being, we're, some of the stuff that is being equated to how the people resisted the faith message when it first came out in the, you know, in the 70s, stuff, how people came against it. <clears throat> well, I'm going to be honest, going back and looking at some of the Now, listen, not, not Brother Hagen and those guys, but a lot of the people were going out, people who were going out preaching stuff were preaching stuff that wasn't Bible. They were confessing somebody else's wife, casting calories out of food. Hello? Believing God they wouldn't get pregnant and then not doing anything not to get pregnant. Hello? Those, 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 that, that did bring a reproach. Crazy stuff did bring a reproach, and rightfully so. Now, Dad didn't preach that kind of stuff. Didn't preach crazy stuff like that. Amen. He preached faith, faith for healing, but didn't preach, you know, you know, casting the calories out of your food and that crazy stuff. People confessing for somebody else's wife. You know, confessing your car out of there. Out of, for you're confessing that you have your car. 
I believe that I received that car you got right now in Jesus' name. Well, that, see, that, is, that, that was crazy. And when people came against that, it was right for them to come against that. It was wrong. It was out of balance. Now, everybody gets defensive a lot of times, but the truth of the matter was it was wrong. We have people preaching spiritual warfare, flying around in helicopters and army fatigues, fighting the demon spirits. Because you had to get up where the demons were to battle them. I always thought, poor Jesus, he had to do it down there on the ground. <laughs> Hello. He, he didn't have a helicopter to fly around in. People show up in church in army fatigues because they were the army of the Lord. And people, people come against it. Rightfully so. And then people try to defend it. There's no defending stupid. Okay? I mean, you just can't defend stupid. Stupid is stupid. My mama said stupid is, stupid does. Forrest Gump? Okay. Some of y'all going like, I ain't never seen that movie before. Hallelujah. So, you know, there, there are things being preached today that are so much excess. Now, maybe certain people aren't preaching that, and they're getting, they're getting piled in with people. But I'm telling you, there's stuff being taught and preached. This lunacy. Matter of fact, it borders on universalism, and, 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 and uh, really, it's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, doctrine of devils, Amen. the stuff that people are a lot of people are preaching. The good news is you're lost without hope, without God in this world. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. That is wonderful news. What? That is the best news you'll ever hear. Listen, beyond a Cadillac or beyond more, uh, health of your body, I'm telling you, getting your spirit born again is the most important thing you will ever do. And the good news is, if you, even though you're lost without God, uh, in union with Satan, Jesus said you're of your father the devil in John 8, 44, that you can be relinquished from that relationship and come into a relationship with God the Father through the covenant of God, through Jesus Christ, and believing on him, confessing him as Lord. The Bible did not say confess him as sugar daddy. It is said confess him as Lord. Selling out. Giving all to him. Committing everything. Lord, I will do what you want me to do. I will go where you want me to go. I will say what you want me to say. I'm sold out to you. If you tell me to leave tomorrow, I'm out of here. <coughs> Reminds me of the story that Dad Hagen used to tell about the guy who would um, he he come into the church and get right with God, and uh, you know get, then then they, you know, of course in the old Pentecostal circles, growing, and growing up Pentecostal, I, I understand this. We'd always get around the altar, usually on either Sunday or Wednesday nights. We just it was just what you did. You didn't get you know you didn't look at your watch and say it's eight o'clock we're getting out. It's eight o'clock we're going to the altar, and we're going to pray around the altar and the and, and the altar workers. That's the old saints would come down and lay hands on you and pray over you in tongues. I mean, and, and, I mean, they'd slap on you. They'd bang on you. They, I mean, they'd do all kinds of stuff to you. If they couldn't cast the devil out, they're going to slap him out. I'm telling you. And they'd lay hands on you and pray over you. And they oh, God, I mean, just, I can hear him now. Brother Paramore standing there on top of me right now. I can hear him. You know, he was old. He was old Pentecostal. When I was young, he was old. He came out of early Pentecost. And walked with the Lord through those years in old, at an early Pentecost. You know, and I remember in, in the 60s, him praying over me and laying hands on me. You know, and he, he, you know, he's going back there into the, to the early Pentecostal days. Hallelujah. How did I get off on that? Oh, so this, this guy, would, he'd be coming to the church. You know, he'd get right with God and get down and start getting down to the altar. And then he'd backslide. And then, you know, sometime later, he'd come back in and recommit his life to the Lord, and he'd get, start getting around the altar and start praying again, and he'd get up and leave, and he, he'd sometimes just get up and run out and wouldn't come back for, for, for long periods of time. And finally, one night, he, he got down to the altar, and, got, and all of a sudden, they heard him. Okay, God, I'll go to Africa! And the Lord spoke to him and said, I didn't want you to go. I just wanted you to be willing to go. See, he didn't want to go to Africa. That's why he didn't want to get too close to the Lord because every time he started getting close to the Lord, God, that, that thing about Africa would start stirring up in him. And all God wanted, see, God wants to know how willing you are. 
Some things he may not want you to do, but you've got to be willing to do them. There's a, there's a lot of young ministers right now who think you can circumvent the process of serving you're just going to go out and do your thing and go out and do your own, your own, and you got it all and you're all this, and you don't want to serve. I guarantee you you're going to have to serve at some point in time. It's a biblical principle. You go study your Bible, and the guys who were elevated were always the ones who had served another and served another man first. Now, you say, I'm saying, they're serving the God in the man. You can go back and study your Bible. Elijah and Elisha. Amen. Jesus and the disciples. Amen. Barnabas and Paul. Paul and Silas. Paul and Timothy. Hello. All through the Bible, there's a principle of service. Now, but there's a selling out. There's selling out. I, I know this. See, this has to do with the covenant. And when you see the covenant, and understand that in covenant, when you came into covenant, what you said, and if you go study this, and again, I recommend it, two books. There are two books I recommend. The big one, which is the foundation book by H. Clay Trumbull, and I think it's still in print, called The Blood Covenant. Okay, still in print. And then there's a mini book by E.W. Kenyon called The Blood Covenant. And he references Trumbull's book numerous times. Okay? Uh, his, so his, his is the mini book that really emphasizes the spiritual things of, of blood covenant based on the historical recordings of H. Clay Trumbull's The Blood Covenant, which was uh, covered living, Stanley Livingston's, Livingston's travels through Africa and all the covenants he cut. Okay? Two very important books that would help you understand covenant in, in a newer dimension. Very important books. Okay? But when they, the, in, in Africa, they were kept recording how that when they would make a covenant, uh, when, when Livingston... Uh, he had, I believe it was Livingston, had, had, the, the, had the bad stomach and had to have goat's milk. And the only thing that would keep his stomach from, from, from bothering him was goat's milk. And he had a goat. And so he would, they would milk the goat. Well, he got somewhere he needed to cut the covenant because what they did is they went through Africa cutting the covenant. He was going to get a spear from the, from the tribal chief. All he was going to get in return. He's got to give up his stomach's appease his mailbox that's right his his living you know zantac all right you know or tagamet is his goat milk and he's got to get that, that tribal chief wanted that in order to cut the covenant and he's going to give him a spear in return okay but see and they said they, they said that when they read the covenant that the, that the witch doctor would come out and pronounce if you break the covenant the most god-awful curses you've ever heard in your life if you broke the covenant. Of course, they were pronounced that, that we're entering the covenant. You know, everything belonged one to another. There was nothing that the one had that did not belong to the other. Okay? Now, what they found out later was that spear had feathers on it. And as they went through Africa, there were tribes that would not attack them because when they saw that feather, they knew if they did, that tribe would come kill them. They didn't know that. They found out later. That spear is what spared their life numerous times because the other tribes knew that that tribe was str the strongest and it would, they would come kill them if they touched them because they knew they were in co he was in covenant with them. All right? But see, when we, see that's why see the, it's, it's the new and the better covenant. So we're in covenant with God. Now, our covenant with God is referring to as diatechi, an unequal covenant, meaning God has all now, let's understand, from our perspective, it's dietetic. God has everything, we have nothing. But in God's eyes, we are his prize. So to God, it's not a dietetic covenant. It's not an unequal covenant. And, and from natural vernacular, and from our side, it is. We get everything. All we, all, we, all we got to give him is us. And that's what he wanted. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave Jesus because we were his prize. Amen. Amen. And so God said, I'll give you everything. How shall he who spared not his own son not also with him freely give us all things? So God says, I'm going to give it to you all. But you know what? You've got to give him all. It's not a thing, it's not a sugar daddy thing. It's, you know, a lot of times we use these examples, and we use these examples to make paint a picture, but if we don't keep it balanced, 
we'll paint the wrong picture. Or if we don't paint the full picture, it will leave the wrong perspective. How many seen that, that, um, that Verizon commercial with all the maps of the United States? You know, they're looking at one carrier, and they look at it, and they can't, I, I don't have a clue what that is. You know, they're, they're coming up, looking at this carrier, I don't know, they finally get one, well, it kind of looks like it might be the United States. Get the variety, oh, that's the United States. And it's the coverage map of, 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 their, of their service. And see, without the full picture, you can't really tell what you're looking at. And a lot of times, we'll use examples about the blank check, and, 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 and these are good examples within the proper context. You know, that God's given us everything. We have access to everything that heaven has. And I'm even going to talk about this when we're talking about covenant. But the fact of the matter is, all that is predicated upon you selling out to him. Not so you can get all that stuff, but because you recognize that without God, you have no hope. You have no future. You have no destiny without Jesus Christ in your life. And so you come and confess him as Lord. You fully submit to his purpose, his plan, his will for your life. And don't, you can't run off and just say, well, his purpose is you're going to have richness and you're not going to have to do anything. You're just going to lay down and look at the finished work. Your purpose is to obey. We should sing that song in, in, in the old Pentecostal circles. It may have sung in the Baptist church, I don't know, but I know Pentecostal. Trust and obey for there is no other way. Amen. Trusting in him and being obedient to him. See, when he's your Lord, you're obedient to him. Well, I mean, I'm just telling you, we're, we're children of God. Yeah, Paul called himself a slave to God. Called, the bond, called himself the bond servant of the Lord. There's a lot of analogies used in the New Testament. We're called, we're called heirs of God, joint heirs of Jesus Christ. We're saints. We're holy. But we're also, you know, Paul refers to himself as a bond servant. That's, see, what's that? The attitude. I'm sold out to the Lord. My position is heirship, joint heirship with Jesus Christ. My attitude is I'm sold out, even to the point of being a bondservant to the Lord. Amen. I'm, I'm sold out. I give it all to him. Amen. If he tells me to pack it up tomorrow and head to Africa, I'm on the first plane. Now, I, I look, you can say, well, I don't understand wisdom, you know, and get, do it. But I understand. Your attitude is, I'm out of here. That's what he says. I've got to obey God. Lester Summerall. How many of you have ever heard of Lester Summerall? Now, I, 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 got, I, I, I um, got to meet Brother Summerall several times and sit at dinner with him a couple times. And, um, you know, just, just uh, he lived his whole life on a vision. His ministry was predicated on a vision he had. He was, he was uh, somewhere in, 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 in the, on a mission trip, and he had a vision and saw a casket and a Bible. And he, that night, he, 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 he was so whatever about that vision that he went to somewhere and they said, I need to get a place, I need that schoolhouse to preach or that, whatever the, the meeting house was. I need to be able to preach. Well, you can't get it. I've got, you don't understand. If I don't preach, I'm going to die. He, his ministry was based on that vision. Now you understand, not, not, the, 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 um, the thrust of it, the, 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 the drive behind him. That's why he was so aggressive. I got a preacher, I'm going to die. He was sold out to the Lord. The Lord, he, he, he knew, if I don't go obey God and preach, I will die. And so he preached. I mean, he, he finally got the place to beat that night and he, because it was so strong. I got the preacher, I'm going to die. And he was like a bull in a china shop the rest of his ministry. Oh, for more men like that. I said for more men who have that kind of zeal and that kind of fervor, that kind of commitment to the gospel. Hello? Amen. That prosperity was not a, mean, a means of them getting the bigger and the, big, and, and the better and the, and the fancier. It was, more, it was a way to get more gospel out. You've got to be careful. When we start becoming reward-minded, or re let me say this, not reward-minded, reward-driven. Reward In other words, I'm going to do this for God because this is in it for me. We need to get back to, I'm doing this for God because I'm a bond servant of the Lord and I walk in obedience to his voice and I do what he says do. Now remember, 
Now, I'm going to mess up some theology here, probably. Remember that when the Lord told Ananias to go sin for one Saul of Tarsus? Not Saul of Tarsus, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Ananias, he told Ananias to go sin for Saul. He, he's, he's with uh, Simon the Tanner, and, okay? And, and the guy says, he says, man, I've heard about, Lord, I've heard about this guy, how great, they, he says, that's all right. He says, he's a chosen vessel of mine. And he said this, I've shown him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And then Paul lists those. Is it in 1st or 2nd Corinthians? 2nd uh, Corinthians? Sorry about chapter uh, 10, 10, 11, 12. Okay. And he starts, start, he goes on list all the things he went through. Perils my country. And he goes on to list all that. But remember, the Lord showed him ahead of time what things he must suffer for his name's sake. Now, how many people, listen, we're running around trying to get people, get, trying to get them into the church through a rock climbing wall, and the Lord already showed Paul what he had to go through if he was going to get saved, and Paul got saved. Hello? Where are the men and women of that level of commitment, even though they know they're going to go through, they're going to suffer this or suffer that or go through this or go through that in order to serve the Lord, they're still going to serve the Lord. You got counselor friends who come up to you telling you, you must have missed God be going through that. Um, we, we got a parallel to you. They're called Job's friends. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord showed him what he would suffer for his, for his name's sake. Now listen, we're not, we're not talking about suffering, sickness, and disease um, for some unknown reason. Are you here? Paul was beaten, Paul was shipwrecked, Paul was uh, uh, in prison, he was fastings and nakedness and thirstings, and I mean thrice, I think thrice, thrice he received 40 stripes, save one. I mean, on and on and on he goes over that whole chapter and lists all the things he went through, but that was all for persecution for preaching the gospel. But he was shown that ahead of time and still committed to follow the Lord and sold out to him 100%. So when you enter into covenant with God, God's already sold out to you 100%. He sent Jesus. Are you here? He's already uh, showed his hand, as it were. You know, you're playing cards, you know, you've, you, know, you, you, you know, you might be the one holding out, trying to see what everybody else has got. God's already put all his cards on the table. He's already shown you what it is. I sent Jesus because I'm after you. I want your whole life, I want you to obey my voice, be led by my spirit. Amen? And you have a choice. Submit to his lordship or keep going the way you're going. You don't have to come into the kingdom. It's a choice. But the church needs to stop trying to weasel them into the kingdom. We need to let them see the cards God's put on the table. And what he says here is all the cards, what, I, what I've got for you, what I'm going to do for you, here's, your, here's what you've got to do. You've got to sell out to me 100%. Now, if you miss it, i got forgiveness for it. If you make a mistake, i got coverage for it. But you're going to sell out to me 100%. You're going to confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that I've raised him from the dead. Now, if you can follow in his lordship, what did the scripture say? I think sometimes we just kind of look at certain things and get kind of goobity gawky, uh, too simple with stuff, and not too, well, I understand. They that are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. Amen. Do you think he's always going to lead you into what you want to do? Now, come on now. Jesus even got to the garden and got and said, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, not my will, but your will be done. You've got to get rid of the sugar daddy mindset that you just pull up and, and, and swipe your, your ATM card and get whatever you want anytime you want, and, uh, no matter what, and, and God can't ask anything of you because you're just, you're just living under grace. We're in a covenant. We're walking in a covenant with God 
where God has already sold out everything to us, laid it out there, here's the deal. Are you all in or all out? Are you all in or are you out? There's no half in with God. So there's no half in with God. Y'all hear you going home. Remember, remember the, uh, the king told Paul, he said, he said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. See, that's halfway in. That's not good enough. Almost is not good enough. Thank you for your enthusiasm. It's Christmas, Pastor. Why are you preaching like this? So if, if, all, if, I am, if all, all things are mine, but I am Christ. Remember what, um, um, over in Galatians chapter 2, I believe. Look over there. Paul wrote to the church. Verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, listen to, this, listen to this terminology, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now, yes, it doesn't come by the law. But remember, we talked about Sunday how that God said to Abraham, which was 400 years before the law, that because you obeyed my voice, I will, I'm going I'm to do this thing. Obedience was part of the covenant of promise. That was 400 years before the law. And when Abraham obeyed the voice of God, God said, because you did this, with the not your son from me. You obeyed my voice. Being led by the Spirit of God means what? You're obeying his voice. Hello? I, I just, I, I tell you what really got me stirred up on this a few years ago. As I read this blog by the, uh, this, this, this quote or blog by this person, it wasn't a blog, it was a, it was a, it was a statement in relationship to a blog, a Looney Tune blog. And this girl's thanking God that because she's under grace, she doesn't have to obey. She doesn't have to give. She doesn't have to go to church. She doesn't have to submit. And just went on and listed all things she didn't have to do that the New Testament tells you you got to do. Well, where does it say obey? It says obey those with the rule over you. Amen. Now, you can't say I don't have to obey when the Bible says to obey. Exactly. It says submit yourselves one to another. You can't get out of submission. Give and it shall be given unto you. You got to give. That was Jesus. That was before the New Testament. Let every man give according as he purposes it on his own heart, not begrudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. I don't have to go to church. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some. See, this girl listed all the things that the Bible told her to do. I said, I'm under grace, I don't have to do it. Now, see, if you're led by the Spirit, that means you're following, you're obeying Him. If I'm leading my family on a hiking trail, and I say, listen, follow me. I know where I'm going. Guess what you've got to do? You have to obey. When I say turn left, you have to obey. If you go straight, when I say turn left, you're going to end up probably in trouble. A number of years ago, we took um, uh, <clears throat> my kids were, I forgot, was it, it, was, it was Shannon's great. We, we took a, a the, the, and she was a statistician for the soccer team. And so we, we took our cabin that my wife's family has up in the mountains. We invited them all there. We cooked barbecue for them, burgers and stuff. And the next day I took them over to, to a trail up there in the mountains to hike on. And I told them when, we got on the, when they got on the trail. I said, guys, everything is a left turn. Everything. The trail is always going to the left. Had a couple of bozos come up there. And, well, several of them, about five or six of them, and decided to take a right turn. Led them right out of the park into a residential section. 
They were all lost. They went miles out of the way to get back. Why? Because they didn't obey. We call it we didn't listen. Obedience is doing what you hear. Obeying that when you obey the voice of God, you are walking in obedience. It's not that hard. Amen. And when you're led by the Spirit of God, He's going to tell you, He's going to speak things to you for you to do. And because you're submitted and yielded to the Lordship of the Master, you do them. That's called walking in the Spirit. Because the Spirit's speaking to you, you're doing what He's telling you, you're walking in the Spirit. But it's also obedience. You have to obey in order to walk in the Spirit. Why are you harping? Because this is the side of the covenant that we don't preach a lot of. We're all excited about all the stuff God did for us. We want to leave out the part where God requires of us in order to get into the, um, get into relationship with what He's done for us is our obedience, our selling out to Him. And by selling out to him, we get access to all the other things. Again, it starts with repentance. Now, people say, well, that just means a change of mind. I think that's a weak, that's a, that's a, that's a watered-down definition of repentance. You know, listen, there's, 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 there's things, there's, there's words that were they're translated through Greek uh, lexicons and stuff. Sometimes they're weak. That doesn't mean they're inaccurate. It just means they're weak. Not, they don't carry the full import. Okay? Now, you read your Bible, and you read, you read the, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where it uses the word love, and, and we just put love in there. But you know what? The word love, agape, Jesus, actually, he kind of coined that Greek word and changed or, or elevated the meaning of that word. If you just go back to classical Greek, agape didn't mean all it means in the New Testament. But it was elevated through Jesus. He kind of took a word and elevated it. We do that all the time in languages. We take words and we elevate their meaning to mean something more, okay, than, than what they meant in, in secular language, okay? In order to define the Greek word agape, we'd have to say the God kind of love, unconditional love, love does not, that does not require. And, and a lot of times when we start talking about repentance, somebody goes, gets just a, a straight leg, kind of goes, you know, it means a change of mind. I, I, can, I can guarantee you something. And I can go get books and pull them out here and show you that d deeper studies show there's more meaning to it than just simply a change of mind. Because the Bible is all about the changing of the spirit. The new birth is about a change of your spirit, not just, as a matter of fact, your mind has to get renewed to get changed. So repentance can't just be a changing of your mind. Repentance has to be a spiritual force with which your spirit comes into a different relationship with God than it was before. Because the Romans tells us that the renew, in order to, that we have to renew our mind, James tells us we have to receive the word of God, to, which is able to save, sozo, the soul, the suke. And so repentance is not simply changing your mind about something. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's a watered down or a weaker uh, explanation of, of repentance. Repentance is a complete turnabout in how you're going that starts with a spiritual change. And repentance for the believer, godly sorrow worketh repentance. If you're not sorry that you displease God, you're not repentive. Well, I, I, I don't get sorry that I displease God. I just thank him that he's, I'm under grace and he's already washed it away. See, there's a half-truth there. The throne of grace is available. The blood of Jesus is at work. But you need to get some stuff out of your, out of your thinking and out of your lifestyle and come to a point that, you, you, you have, that, that if you are sold out to God, you don't want to displease Him. If you, love your, if you love your Heavenly Father, it should bring sorrowfulness to you that you have dishonored Him by sinning. Now, no, listen, I'm not talking about groveling for six months in it. Repent. That, see, the displeasure should, should hit you immediately that you displeased him, the sense of that, and you repent and get that right and say, you know, Father, I, I, I displeased you. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I should not have displeased you. 
I should not have gone contrary to your will. We got people teaching you don't do that. That's wrong to do that. It's lack of faith. To, to, to say, God, I'm sorry I displeased you as a Christian. I dishonored you by my actions. No, you, you're, 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 that's, that's, that's not God. That's not Bible. I don't know what they're talking about when they say that. If, you, if you're sold out to God, you know what? If you love your spouse and you do something that hurts them, you shouldn't go, well, we're married. We're in a marriage covenant, and, you know, and I'm under the marriage grace. So I'm not even sorry that I did it. It's already covered by our covenant. Try that with your wife and see what happens. You will get introduced to iron cast frying pan probably. Hello? You might still be in a covenant with her, but I'm telling you right now, if you've, if you've done wrong and you've gone contrary and you've done injury, you need to repent. And the same thing with your heavenly father. Why would we do that with our heavenly father? The Bible tells us if we got ought against someone or someone has ought against us, we go, need to go get it straight before we even bring a gift to the altar. What would we do with our father who sold out everything for us? Why is it that people go this way? Because they don't understand covenant or don't want to understand it. Or they're looking for a free ride. Or they got doctors and devils. They got devils talking on their shoulders. I'm going to say something. Follow the money. You watch and see what people do. And a lot of times when everybody's running, they're running and throwing money at the hottest, newest, latest, greatest. And people are preaching it because it's getting the most money. And God's going to judge it. And we better straighten up in the church. We have to preach truth whether it causes us to suffer. Paul went through financial hardship preaching the truth. You go read it. He got one place he had to go back to making tents just to, just to survive. Because there wasn't any money coming in. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Where? <laughs> See, when we were in covenant, see, so God's made a covenant. He, and see, and the thing is, he's already done it. He's already cut the covenant. He's already made the provision. It's all there for us. And then Paul writes and says, if you'll confess it as Lord and believe in your heart God's raised you from the dead, you'll be saved. You'll be sozo. Here it all is. You get health, you get healing, you get prosperity, you get, you know, um, covering for your house, you get peace, you get tranquility, but you're going to have to sell out to me 100%. You can't hold back anything. And we see that lesson with Ananias and Sapphira. Now, I know people, some of these, these extreme grace, radical grace people, See, I, I, see, we start saying grace people, and everybody, starts a bunch of, everybody who teaches the Bible and teaches the subject of grace to the same pan, pan, and they're not the same. There's biblical grace. And it's a powerful, powerful, powerful message. Amen. It's, it's, it's a central, it's a central part of the gospel. But the, I, I had one person say, Ananias and Sapphire probably weren't even saved. On what basis? Because they died. They got judged. See, if they had been a Christian, they wouldn't have gotten judged. Why? Because that fits their mantra. Well, the Bible don't say that. They were in the church. They walked in before the apostles. Held back, held back. See, I'm pointing out the holding back. Are you all in for God or all in, or not? Are you 100% for the Lord or are you not? Can you pray and ask and tell the Lord, I'll go where you want me to go, I'll do what you want me to do, I'll say what you want me to say, or not? God's looking for a church that's sold out. I look at people in these other countries. I believe in prosperity. But you can also manipulate Bible subjects. 
I see people doing what they're doing for the kingdom in some countries with the lack that's there just because the economy of the country is not there. They're living good according to the standards of the country, but they're not living like they are, we would in America. I watch people in America go from church to church to church to church and preach prosperity and live big and fly around and, and go on vacation six times a year and have horses and do this and do that and do this and do that. And they're always doing this. They're always on this kind of vacation. And then I know, I know missionaries that, that, that are preaching good Bible, that love God. And they had to write and say, we, we, our car broke down. We need, we need to get some extra money to get our car fixed. Well, they don't believe in prosperity. You, you, me, you go live where they're living. You go stand in the place that they're standing in, the economy that they've been standing in. And then come back and tell me that they don't believe God. Some of the laws for our missionaries, particularly in Europe, are so restrictive about what they can and can't do as far as finances and that kind of stuff. It's, it's unbelievable. Someone has to have $5,000, $6,000 a month in, in support before you, they can even come into the country. And let me tell you, in their economy, it doesn't care, go very far. You think we got inflation here? You ought to try Europe. They, we were paying $8, 6 and $8 a gallon to drive around Europe 15 years ago. Pull up and it was... X number, you see it as X number of euros for a liter. And, it was, and, and you, when you translate it back into English, not English, back into dollars and gallons, it was six to eight dollars a gallon. And we got missionaries over there. And, and people right in here go, well, I want you to fly me in. I want you to pay my bills, hotel bill. I want you to feed me every meal. I want you to ship all my products to the next church. I want you to let me get, get uh, you know, uh, new covenant partners. And da 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 And they're, they're, they're running around the big, 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 big cocky and all this kind of stuff. Talking about how God's prospered them. We got missionaries out there who don't get to come back to America once every so often. Are y'all here? But they've sold out to the gospel. Uh, my question sometimes is, how many of these people keep doing it if they had to live like the people in those places are living? Yeah. We've presented a message to the church that's out of balance. Not that God prosperity is wrong, it's, we've got it out of balance. I don't believe you're going to have biblical prosperity until you're sold out biblically. Sound like something Pastor Hagen would preach probably on Wednesday night or in class in, 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 in one of the, in the Bible school classes. <coughs> Can you say amen or oh me? Amen. 